The pendulum does seem to be swinging in an odd sort of way, doesn't it? But then, of course, things aren't always like they seem to be. It depends how you look at them. You were looking through the camera on the roundabout. Now, just concentrate for a moment on the line joining the center of the roundabout, where Emily's holding the pendulum, to where I am. Is the pendulum really changing its direction of swing? But it did look different viewed by the camera on the roundabout. Something that's happening in a frame of reference that's rotating is going to look different from what it will look like in a frame of reference that isn't. Now, I guess, Ian and Emily, you'd better take a bit of a rest or you'll be getting giddy or something. I thought you'd like to see this, just in case you weren't able to follow up the advice we gave you in the text of the unit, or maybe you decided, like I did, that the park keeper might take exception to your larking about on a merry-go-round in the children's playground. This simple demonstration illustrates a basic idea about scientific thinking. If we want to understand a situation or a phenomenon, we often have to take off from outside of the restricted framework uh, of our everyday observations and in our mind's eye look at things from a viewpoint quite different from the normal. So a swinging pendulum like this can look quite straightforward and simple. But in the frame of reference like the one that Ian and Emily were in, it can look a good deal more complicated. Now, as you know, the Earth has something in common with this roundabout. It rotates about its axis, and it also orbits around the Sun. So things seen from the surface of the Earth, like the rising and setting of the Sun and the phases of the Moon, are likely to look a lot more complicated than they really are. To make sense of these phenomena, the early astronomers had to make an extraordinary leap of the imagination to escape from the Earth-bound context of things as they seem to be and to view them from the vantage point, as it were, of the gods and the angels. No wonder that they were accused of blasphemy at the time. Now, we've chosen to tell the story of how the present-day model of the solar system fits with observations from the Earth, because this illustrates a basic thing about scientific thinking, the importance of mental detachment and of imagination. Scenes like these have fired human imagination since time immemorial, but more often in the arts than in science. Yet it did require imagination to perceive these everyday events as they actually are, rather than as they seem. After all, it's so much easier to think of the heavenly procession of sun and moon and stars across the sky as being due to their motion around the Earth. Nowadays, millions of people have seen the Earth from afar through pictures like these. The mental leap has been made, and the Earth is easily visualized as a giant roundabout with us as passengers on it. So, shouldn't we expect to see effects on the Earth that we saw on the children's roundabout? Let's just be clear what effect we're looking for. What I've got here is a model Earth. And here, over the north pole of the Earth, I've suspended a pendulum. And the pendulum's firmly attached to the Earth. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to release this pendulum in the plane determined by the support. It is directly away from and towards me. And I'm now going to rotate the Earth. and the pendulum still swings directly away from and towards me. The plane of the pendulum is fixed. But you can only say that from your vantage point of being able to look down on the system. It's fixed when you're looking into the system, and obviously the Earth is rotating away underneath that fixed pendulum plane. 
But if you're on the Earth itself, then it's not quite as obvious as that, because you think that you're fixed. You think that your position here is fixed, and it's the plane of the swing of the pendulum that's rotating. So, if we can detect a rotation of the plane of swing of the pendulum on the Earth, then that's evidence for a rotating Earth. Now, Leon Foucault, an eminent French scientist, reckoned he could demonstrate this effect. In 1851, he suspended from the Dome of the Pantheon in Paris a huge pendulum, 67 metres in length. And then he invited the gentry of Paris to come along and witness the outcome of the experiment for themselves. We've attempted to reconstruct Foucault's experiment, but just a little bit nearer home. As you can see, there's a striking resemblance between Foucault's demonstration in the Pantheon and ours here in St. Paul's. Of course, Foucault didn't get this idea and then rush straight out and demonstrate it in public. He tried it out first on a small scale in his cellar. Now that was in January 1851 and his demonstration in the Pantheon was in February. It must have made quite an impression for within a few months it had been repeated all over the world including in at least two places here in Britain, in York Minster and in St. Nicholas's Church in Bristol. But none of these demonstrations was on quite such a magnificent scale as this. That cable there is all of 82 meters long. That's 15 meters longer than the one Foucault had. And the view down the cable from the support at the top of the dome is really breathtaking. It's a pretty massive pendulum. It weighs over 80 kilograms, which helps it to keep swinging in spite of the effect of air resistance, which, of course, gradually damps the swing down. Unfortunately, we couldn't seal up St. Paul's Cathedral and pump all the air out, so we just have to put up with air resistance. There's another thing we were very concerned about, and that was to make sure that nothing would prevent the direction of swing of the pendulum relative to the cathedral uh, from changing. And indeed also to make sure that nothing would make the direction of swing change, even if the Earth weren't spinning. So. The first thing we had to do was to hang the pendulum quite still for a long time to get all the twists out of the cable. And then we designed a support up the top there with a ball bearing so that the cable would be quite free to swivel. Another problem was how to launch the pendulum without giving it any sideways movement. For this, we tied it up to a pedestal, and then we took a leaf out of Foucault's book. Well, it's already cut a bit of a slice through the ridge of sand in the four minutes or so since we launched it. So let's just see if we can figure out if it's that much in four minutes, well, that will make eight, 12, say, two there. That makes an angle of just three degrees to the initial direction of swing. So there's our quarter of an hour. Now, I think I'd better explain this to you. 
Well, just imagine that the melon represents the Earth. And here's the North Pole. Now, if you hung a pendulum right over the top of the North Pole in just the way that Keith was doing a minute ago, and let it, let it just swing, why, as the Earth rotates underneath the pendulum, the pendulum simply goes on swinging, and in, in 24 hours, the Earth's gone around 360 degrees. So that'll give you a shift of 15 degrees per hour. But if you come down here to the equator, and set your pendulum swinging north-south as the Earth rotates, why the pendulum will just go on swinging up and down in the same plane as before. No shift. Incidentally, just the same thing if you set the pendulum swinging in an east-west direction on the plane of the equator. It would just go on swinging in the plane of the equator. So at the equator, there will be no deviation of the swing of the pendulum relative to the Earth the maximum possible effect at the North Pole, well, where we are in London, it'll be something in between. And since we are rather nearer the North Pole here than the equator, it's just a little bit less, 12 degrees per hour. Now, let's see what's the pendulum been doing while I was explaining that to you. Oh, yes, it's moved a bit in the right direction too, so we'll see what it does to the pencil at the end of our quarter of an hour. Now, the problem with observing anything from the Earth, from this crazy roundabout we all live on, is that not only does it spin around its own axis, but it also goes careering at a great speed in an orbit around the Sun. And this makes it very difficult to interpret the apparent movements of the other bodies in the solar system, even now nearest neighbors like Mars or our old friend, the moon. We're rather pleased with these shots. If you think you're looking perhaps through a telescope of the moon going through its phases, then we did fool you. Because what you were actually looking at was this model moon as viewed from the camera in our model Earth. And the moon was illuminated by sunlight coming in in this direction from our model sun, a lamp, which is over there. And to get the lunar phases, we were moving the moon all the way around the Earth. Now, a word of caution here, because although we've got the size of the moon in the right proportion to the size of the Earth, we've got the distance between the Earth and the Moon completely wrong. In fact, on this sort of scale, the Moon ought to be ten times further away. Nevertheless, the model was sufficiently good for us to be able to produce fairly convincing lunar phases. Now, as I was saying, you were looking at the phases from this camera on our model Earth. So, what you were seeing is more or less what you'd see from the real Earth the moon going through its various phases, apparently changing shape. But you know from our intellectual model of the Earth-Moon system, that's not the case. You know that the moon and the Earth are a fixed shape, they're both spheres. It's just that the moon goes round the Earth. So this apparent change of shape must be some sort of illusion effect when you look at it from the Earth. To, to see what's really going on, you really need to, so to speak, get outside the system and look in on it. So let's go right back through that sequence again, take the moon over the other side of the Earth and see how it looks from a vantage point out there. Here's our starting position and this is the moon's orbit. Now sunlight comes into the system here and the angle between the sun, the Earth and the moon is about 20 degrees. As seen from the Earth, the moon appears to be a crescent. Move the moon round a little bit and the crescent increases. When the moon's position is such that the angle between the sun and the moon is 90 degrees, a right angle, then we see a half moon from the Earth. Move the moon a bit further round and we see the gibbous moon.
the next phase should be almost full moon with the sun the earth and the moon almost in line but instead we get a partial eclipse and at the exact full moon position we get a total eclipse the earth completely blocked out the sunlight and that will happen every month every time the moon gets behind the sun and the earth instead of getting a full moon we'll get a total lunar eclipse now we don't see eclipses every month so obviously the model is wrong but it doesn't mean we have to throw the model out completely what we do is we modify it slightly if I turn down the light I can show you how I simply raise the moon up so it comes into the sunlight and now you can see that we will get a full moon the only difference is that the moon's orbit must be inclined to the earth it's no longer in the same plane as the sun and the earth so the thing to do now is go back and have a look at it from outside the system with this orbit inclined of course the angle here is greatly exaggerated because the moon in our model was too close but we have got round that difficulty of an eclipse every month the moon now misses the earth's shadow altogether but we've got another problem how do we ever manage to see eclipses well you've got to remember that the earth and the moon also rotate about the sun and in this sort of position we can get an eclipse though they're now much rarer than once a month well we seem to be doing pretty well so far by having this double-edged approach of looking at the things from the earthbound observers viewpoint and from the viewpoint of an observer outside the system we seem to be showing that our observation and our model are consistent with each other in fact we've explained the lunar phases and the eclipses of the moon in terms of the moon orbiting the earth and the earth orbiting the sun so it seems reasonable to carry on this double viewpoint approach to see if we can't explain some of those more peculiar phenomena that we see when we look out at the planet if you look at a planet in the sky night after night then you'll see that its position changes relative to the background of fixed stars and then sometimes it seems to loop back on itself this motion which seems very odd from the earth viewpoint is the so-called retrograde motion now the difficulty arises because we have two motions to consider the motion of the planet in its orbit around the Sun and also the motion of the earth herself around the Sun now when we sight on the planet suppose this planets Mars when we sight on the planet we sight on it against the background of the stars so first of all let's see how that star background looks from the earth as the earth moves around her orbit suppose the earth is here in her orbit then there's probably a star off in this direction let me denote that with a little arrow the earth trundles on around her orbit and gets this position and the direction to that same star is just the same as the earth goes round the orbit to here the direction to that same star is just the same and the reason for that is simply because the distance across the Earth's orbit is quite negligible compared with the much much greater distance to the star in fact on this scale the distance to the nearest star would be about 20 miles okay so the star direction is the same no matter where the Earth is let me put the Earth back and look of the line of sight from the earth now to the planet to mars and you can see that when the earth here and mars is here in the orbit 
then the line of sight is to the right of the star direction. If both planets move round their orbit like so, there comes a position when the line of sight from the Earth to the planet is in the same direction as the star direction. And further around the orbit still, the line of sight to the planet now is to the left of the star direction. So what we want to see is how this star line of sight relative to the star direction changes as both planets go around their orbit. Well, to do that, we've connected up this rod here, which represents the line of sight between the Earth and the planet, to, electronically, to a display screen. And if I disconnect the rod, you can see that when the line of sight is to the right of the star direction, the spot on the screen is to the right. When the line of sight is straight up in the star direction, the spot is central. And when the line of sight is to the left of the star direction, the spot is off to the left. So all I have to do to see the full trajectory now of the things as they move around is motorize it, let it go. And I can do that by switching on. Well, I think you could see the retrograde motion there. But we can actually do even better than that. You see, as we've got the model at the moment, the orbit of the Earth and the orbit of the planet are in the same plane. But in real life, the orbit of the planet is likely to be inclined slightly relative to the orbit of Earth. So we're going to introduce some sort of vertical component into the line of sight. And we can simulate that electronically by introducing a vertical component into the display screen. So if I run the whole thing back, we can see how it looks when we've got that vertical component in. So the planets come back to their original position here. And I'll now switch on with the vertical component. And here the planet loops on itself and loops again. And that trace is more or less what you would get if you plotted out the position of the planet every single night against the star background. Now, this process of making a leap of imagination, of moving in your mind's eye to a viewpoint outside your normal viewpoint, is absolutely essential when we come to formulate and perhaps modify our scientific models. But we've always got to be prepared to put our imaginative ideas to the test. And the real test of any scientific model is to see just how it stands up in the light of the experimental fact.